So welcome everyone. My name is Sonia Hall. I'm the uh, coordinator for the strategy core team that has been working on uh, the planning for climate adaptation in Cascadia. Thank you for joining this first quarterly check-in of 2022. Uh, and we're excited to share with you the blueprint for a resilient Cascadia, which we have been working on uh, for uh, pretty intensively the last year um, and earlier than that as well. So for those of you who may not have participated in these quarterly webinars before, the work that we share and the progress that we discuss in these webinars is work um, carried forth under the umbrella of the Cascadia Partner Forum that has articulated a vision for our region where the environment is resilient to the impacts of climate change and where that is thanks in part to a diverse group of partners from different walks of life who are working together to conserve connected networks of lands and waters such that our natural systems are resilient and provide and support flexible options for all of us far into the future. So, um, as I mentioned, this group has convened um, and has been working for a while on a transboundary large landscape climate adaptation strategy for Cascadia. In 2020, we focused within the, the, um, the need to ad adapt, adapt and adjust as um, COVID restrictions were put in place. We focused on engagement on the design of the process for really co-developing this climate adaptation strategy and, and focusing on the goals and objectives. And then in 2021, a large group came together to co-develop this climate adaptation strategy. And that's the focus of what we're gonna talk today. Um, and so though this effort was, was really intended to be a pilot because um, there is a lot to be learned about this kind of large scale effort, we're really excited about the outcome of this phase one and the blueprint that we will share today. <clears throat> and so not only will we share that blueprint, but we hope to really uh, obtain useful input and engagement from you all and your perspectives on how to best transition to implementing the strategies that are part of this blueprint, even as there are continued conversations on the need and the characteristics that a, a phase two of this um, climate adaptation planning process could entail. So what we are going to do today is um, we'll give a presentation sharing the blueprint for a resilient Cascadia. We will um, follow up that presentation with a series of short activities where we really want to hear your thoughts around the priority strategies um, that, that you heard, around where you see opportunities for leveraging existing work or aligning with existing work and where there are gaps. And then to, to really have, have your input on how these strategies align and support and can really enhance your work uh, and, and your efforts to support your values and achieve your missions. And therefore, through that, how can we work together to implement the strategies that are part of the blueprint? Um, to get us started, I'm going to hand it over to um, these four folks who have been leads in different aspects of co-developing this blueprint for a resilient Cascadia. Carly, unfortunately, was unable to join us today, um, and so Bill will be will be sharing some of the the work that Char that Carly led. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you all were aware of uh, these folks who will be talking to you today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mead Crosby to share the blueprint for a resilient Cascadia. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, here, let me pull up my presentation real fast. OK. 
Okay, let's try that again. Got it. Okay, well, this is super exciting. We've been working on this a long time and it's with many of you who are on the call today and many other partners throughout Cascadia. So it is my pleasure to uh, help us introduce the Blueprint for Resilient Cascadia, a transboundary adaptation plan for our shared natural systems. So when we talk about Cascadia and the Blueprint, we are referring to the area outlined in blue here on the left. So the Cascade Range and its surrounding lowlands throughout the transboundary region of Washington and British Columbia. And when we talk about a resilient Cascadia, we're talking about a region that maintains its ecological and cultural values in the face of a changing climate, changes that we're already seeing right now through increased wildfire and flooding and heat events and, and other impacts of climate change that are already affecting our human and natural communities. So what would a resilient Cascadia look like? It would be one in which we have maintained intact core areas, so um, relatively large uh, areas of habitat that are still in good condition and maintaining its ecological functions and cultural values. Uh, we're talking about a region where those habitats are ecologically connected. So plants and animals and ecological processes can move through the landscape, which is so important for their ability to adapt to climate change. Uh, we're talking about a region that is biodiverse, that has maintained many of its native species, um, as well as species that are going to be moving into our area uh, from elsewhere as the climate changes. We want a region that is resilient to disturbance, disturbances that we're already seeing increase on the landscape. Um, can it bounce back after fire, after flood to maintain its ecological and cultural values? And also one that contains refugia. So refugia from those disturbances, refugia from climate change, areas on the landscape where plants and animals will have a better chance of hunkering down and um, being able to stay in this landscape despite the changes that are occurring. So while there are a range of actions that land and wildlife managers and communities could take to support resilience of the ecological landscape, it's often the socio-political landscape that presents the primary barriers to implementing those actions. Um, so barriers like having the capacity to take action to address any of those needs on the right there on the ecological landscape? Um, do you have the resources you need? Do you have um, the information and science you need to make good decisions about um, where to preserve uh, areas on the landscape or um, um, preserve uh, ecological uh, refugia to climate change or to disturbance, um, to reconnect our landscapes or maintain connectivity? Do you have the capacity to even act on any of these things? Um, if you do have the capacity, are you coordinated with uh, neighboring jurisdictions or landowners? We have a huge patchwork of diverse jurisdictions, land ownerships, um, and borders and boundaries across this landscape. Uh, if we want to maintain these values, these ecological and cultural values across the whole landscape, we need to be coordinated across all of those boundaries. Are folks motivated, even if they are, if they do have the capacity, if they are coordinated, are they motivated to take those actions? Um, and even if all those were true, do they have the authority to take any of the actions? We have run up against this again and again, where folks may know what they need to do and they simply don't have the authority to act. The policies and mandates are not in place for them to take the necessary action. And then even if all of that was in place, you need the money to actually take these actions. So is the funding in place? Do all of these align? Um, and so the goal of the blueprint is to support transboundary landscape scale climate adaptation across Cascadia by identifying strategies and actions that would help address these key barriers to the sociopolitical enabling conditions for a climate resilient Cascadia. So to better understand these barriers and also to identify key strategies and actions for addressing them, the blueprint was co-produced 
by a group of participants that represent the wide range of entities engaged in Cascadia conservation and climate adaptation. So these included um, approximately 48 individual participants who uh, represented private, federal, First Nations, First Nations and tribes, foundations, nonprofits, provincial and state government, research institutes and universities. Um, and this group worked together in three different working groups. One was addressing structural barriers uh, present across the whole landscape. So this was kind of a, an, a top down look at the landscape to look at overarching issues that were um, impeding implementation of climate adaptation. And then we had two more sort of bottom up target specific working groups that one was focused on salmonids and one was focused on carnivores. And it's not that we only think that salmonids and carnivores are important. These were sort of two initial looks at key uh, conservation priorities for the Cascadia Park Reform and its partners. We spent uh, the better part of last year working together to co-develop the blueprint. And we did this through a series of workshops and then intervening research and analysis uh, by both participants in the working groups and a research support team based at the University of Washington with the Climate Impacts Group. And all of this work was also done with the support of um, a suite of indigenous engagement principles developed by the Cascadia Partner Forum. And I'm not gonna dive into these right now because Gwen Bridge is going to give a presentation in just a moment that will dive further into um, our approach in engaging uh, with indigenous governments, communities, and individuals uh, through this work. Uh, so I led the whole landscape working group. Again, we were looking at these big structural issues that were standing in the way of large landscape transboundary climate resilience work in Cascadia. And we together identified six overarching strategies to address the barriers that um, participants identified. Um, and we drew also from existing literature, from interviews with experts and from uh, participants own experience and expertise. I'm gonna go through each one of these individually now. So the first strategy is the, to establish a formal governance structure to facilitate strategic and coordinated large landscape resilience across political boundaries in Cascadia. So again, I mentioned that the landscape is divided into this patchwork of varied land uses, tenures and jurisdictions. And so our connectivity and adaptation efforts thus far have been relatively piecemeal across the region with legal and regulatory differences, as well as conflicting priorities between entities and sectors. So we've had really disjointed action. Large landscape transboundary climate resilience is going to require us to have some sort of formal governance structure to ensure equitable and effective decision making, resource sharing, cooperative management across the Cascadia region. Um, so, among the actions that we identified to support this is the need to identify and implement appropriate transboundary agreements that can help facilitate commitment to transboundary climate resilience. We've seen this in many different regions across the Washington, across the US Canadian border, for example, and throughout the world, um, things like MOUs, things like joint resolutions um, that, can, that can help provide the mandate and the necessary support um, to ensure ongoing coordination across borders to support large landscape resilience. Um, and we also wanna ensure that these agreements facilitate resource sharing and address limits to agency or organizational capacity across all parties with equity as a major consideration. And we wanna define appropriate pathways for engaging with other decision-making bodies that are outside of that proposed governance model. Our second strategy is to center indigenous leadership, sovereignty and values into all aspects of transboundary large landscape climate resilience efforts. And this is to promote both reconciliation um, in this work and also the long-term success of this work. This is gonna be key to um, successful long-term climate resilience in Cascadia. Actions we identified include operationalizing this idea of ethical space, which is a means of engagement that supports relational accountability and respect for different ways of knowing. 
Um, we want to operationalize this as a process for co-developing Cascadia resilience efforts with Indigenous and non-Indigenous partners. Um, other example actions would be to support recognition and broader implementation of things like Indigenous protect, protected conservation areas in Canada and explore the development of similar um, programs within the U.S. in a manner that supports the rights, responsibilities, and priorities of Indigenous peoples. And again, these are just a couple for each of these strategies, I'm providing just a couple example actions. There are more, and I'll talk about how you can um, see all the rest of the actions after I run through the strategies. The third strategy is to mainstream transboundary large landscape resilience into decision existing decision making structures at all levels of government and management to ensure implementation. So actions include things like providing technical guidance on how regional act actors can adopt transboundary large landscape resilience strategies into their existing plans and policies. Um, so we really want to illustrate the co-benefits of aligning the blueprint with regional governments, NGOs, and other organizations' strategic priorities. How can this already support what they're doing um, and help them to better do their work to um, work at a large landscape scale toward climate resilience. We wanna strategically integrate and elevate large landscape resilience into the development of new policies and plans relevant to Cascadia's natural systems and develop technical training opportunities related to large landscape resilience for staff at all levels of government within Cascadia. The fourth strategy is the need to conduct joint assessment monitoring and evaluation of transboundary large landscape climate resilience to support coordinated ad adaptive management toward socio-ecological goals. And to do this in ways that honor multiple knowledge systems, so including Western science, as well as local and indigenous knowledge when developing um, Cascadia resilience indicators. So actions include things like developing transboundary consensus, on analytical and modeling approaches for mapping, monitoring, and evaluating climate resilience indicators. So observations are comparable across boundaries. So if we're going to take a large landscape lens, we need seamless, consistent uh, methods for uh, understanding what's happening on the landscape and evaluating the effectiveness of our actions to improve resilience. And we need to be able to evaluate the current status of socio-ecological resilience in our terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems and identify priorities for action appropriate to each ecosystem in a regional and transboundary context. Our fifth strategy is to invest in the relationship building that is required to build the social capital, the political commitment, and public support for transboundary large landscape climate resilience. So actions include things like identifying political champions who are interested in Cascadia resilience goals and develop a network of support across higher levels of government for this work. We want to educate policymakers on the value of large landscape climate resilience, specifically to public health, um, the economy and cultural benefits for their constituents. And we wanna broaden the base for policy innovation by engaging issue networks and community groups that have historically not been engaged in relevant decision-making spaces. Our final strategy is to establish a sustainable funding model to support the strategic coordination, planning, implementation, and monitoring of timely transboundary climate resilience efforts at scale. Actions include things like developing a funding matrix that aligns existing and emerging federal, state, and private funding programs to blueprint strategies and supporting actions, identifying a coordinating entity to provide fiscal management support and administer shared funding streams to support transboundary large landscape resilience efforts and propose a state, provincial or federal fund uh, to support transboundary large landscape resilience efforts. So I'm now gonna pass it off to Bill who is going to talk to us about actions specific to the Salmonids and carnivore working groups. Great, thanks Mead. Uh, yeah, so the Salmana group, um, I'm covering here for Carly Vinn, who led this group. Um, they benefited from the participation of around 20 individuals. Um, 
They benefited from the perspectives on both sides of the border, a variety of organizations and foundations and First Nations were represented in the, in the effort in that working group. Um, and we're very, very grateful for the commitment that these people made to, to that working group. Um, the, the working group recognized that there are many uh, programs underway, existing programs relevant to salmonid conservation and restoration. Um, but there, there was a need to integrate um, climate resiliency into many of these ongoing programs. Um, each of the six uh, whole landscape strategies that we just went over, each of those are relevant to the Salmonid working uh, group, but the working group then took those and boiled those down to sets of actions that were unique to the Salmonid group. And the carnivore group did exactly the same thing. They looked at those six strategies and identified things that were unique to, to that particular conservation target. Next slide. So the Salmonid, I'm just gonna highlight a handful of the Salmonid actions. There's much, much more detail. I think they identified over 20 specific actions in the blueprint. So there's a lot more detail in the blueprint itself. Um, but these actions include things like um, leveraging the, uh, the, the leveraging that salmon are really uh, central to the identity, our identity here in the Northwest. Also recognizing that there are these reciprocal relationships between humans and salmonids, and that's gonna be really important and central to developing effective management under changing climates. Uh, building off of existing transboundary uh, engagements, there's a lot of work underway and we can, we can leverage that work. Uh, some examples were uh, efforts in, in terms of the Salish Sea and the Columbia River, those collaborative processes are good examples to build from. And then understanding that we can, we can build Salmonid uh, strongholds into the America the Beautiful efforts and, and other climate focused conservation efforts that are occurring at the federal level in both the US and Canada. So those again are just a very few of many um, actions that were identified by the, the Salmon Working Group. On the carnivore side, um, again, a, 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 a diverse and committed group. Um, we really benefited from uh, a lot of good, good thought and conversation, a lot of experience here uh, working with carnivores in, in this region. Next slide. We also identified a set of actions that were again, focused or, or relevant to each of the strategies. Uh, we identified the, the, the need to uh, enhance communication uh, using some of the existing working groups like groups focused on grizzly bear recovery or the Cascade Carnival Working Group, those groups, but enhancing the communication between those groups um, and, uh, and, and but, but using them as good starting places or building blocks for um, uh, more effective sort of communication uh, that covered all the carnivores. Next slide. We also uh, wanted to uh, promote the, um, uh, the involvement of indigenous uh, views and um, perspectives in the existing working groups, but also uh, promote leadership uh, um, of indigenous uh, members into these working groups. We also uh, recognize that there is an opportunity to, uh, and a need to create a monitoring uh, framework uh, that works across the, the entire uh, uh, Cascadia region. Uh, we wanna link this to the work that's underway um, with Teradapt, which is a spatial tool that allows us to look at spatial priorities and identify areas of, of key importance for these carnivores. So linking our monitoring framework to that Teradap tool. And we also wanted to recognize that um, there's a lot of unknowns and we need to be able to be flexible and uh, adaptive as we move through this process. So recognizing that, that ability to, be, um, uh, to, to evolve and adapt. Thank you, Bill. So uh, as we mentioned, that's just a small subset of the actions that we identified to support these six overarching strategies. And you can read more about uh, the 
reason for these strategies, what the barriers were that were identified that led to the identification of these strategies, um, and uh, a broader suite of actions in our summary report that is now, as of this morning, available to you. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing for a second to take you on a little spin through, if I can, there we go. Okay, so let me actually stop share and then I wonder if I can, hold on, let's see if I can share this screen instead. I wanna show you how you can, well, yes, I can show you how you can access all of this. Um, okay. So you can now go on our website and see all of our products. Um, so you can go to the Cascadia Partner Forum site and up at the top here, you'll see uh, the blueprint for Resilient Cascadia tab. Um, on the landing page for the blueprint, you can download um, the PDF of the report. Um, and it is a very, it is not a dense, long read it's it's 27 pages in total and um i will just put a special thank you into erica sinas with the climate impacts group who made it a really beautiful document um, to look at as well so um, i highly recommend taking a look at the report which again describes how we developed the strategy um, and uh, walks through each of the um strategies one by one and describes the challenge of the barriers that were there, the approach we're um, suggesting for addressing these barriers, and then a suite of representative actions. So you can download the report. Um, the website is also, it does summarize those act the strategies uh, on that landing page. So um, you can take a glance at them there. We have some perspective from Cascadia leaders um, on why we are, why, why this need to be working across boundaries like this. Why do we need a large landscape approach to climate resilience in Cascadia? And then you can read more about development of the blueprint, our indigenous engagement principles, and you can also explore the blueprint. So there's a link there, but there's also a link up here for exploring um, the strategies and actions online through the Resilient Cascadia Action Library. So you can download the whole library. So you can download all of the actions and um, supporting steps and conditions uh, into an, an Excel spreadsheet, but you can also explore them here with this interactive tool. And so uh, the library is organized by strategy. You can select, when you get there, all of the strategies are selected and all of the conservation targets are selected, but you can also filter and just look, for example, if you just want to look at car carnivores, you can deselect some on its landscapes or um, use whichever one you want to look at and then update the actions. But it's organized, the library is organized by each strategy uh, and then shows you each of the actions. And then there's a little symbol saying if this was for a whole landscape or specifically for carnivores or salmonids. And then any supporting steps that we identified uh, that could help in implementing that action. And I'll just make a note that these six overarching strategies um, were identified as being important for whole landscape and for salmonids and for carnivores, but there, and many of these actions for the whole landscape are relevant to carnivores and salmonids and likely to many of the other conservation targets we might look at in the future. But the working groups for salmonids and carnivores also identified some other specific actions for um, those targets that complement the more general high level actions from the whole landscape. And so you can find those in here too and scroll through the different strategies to see the different actions. I think there's something like 88 total um, actions in the library. Okay, I'm trying to share my, my, my PowerPoint has a, uh, a little issue with, um, with Zoom and it makes me restart every time I want to share slides. So hold on, I'm restarting and pulling up my slides. Okay, there we go. And sharing again.
Okay. So um, please go check out our website, uh, check out the tool um, and uh, the report and take a look. And uh, if you have any feedback, uh, we'd love to hear it um, because this is, this is supposed to be a living document. Uh, this is supposed to be responsive and adaptive. And we anticipate doing additional conservation targets in the future. Um, but most, Sonia will tell you more about next steps in a moment. So I'm not gonna tell you about next steps, but I do wanna say thank you so much to all of the partners who participated in the development of the blueprint. Um, it, was, it was quite a year as it was with COVID and, and all that. And so especially given what a hard year it was, the fact that people took the time to participate in this remote uh, virtual uh, engagement process uh, was really incredible and inspiring. So thank you all so much. Thanks, Mead. We will now go to Gwen to hear about the indigenous engagement aspects that, that were really integral to the co-development process. Okay, great. Um, thanks, you guys. That's wonderful. I'll um, jump right into my presentation. I just wanted to say that I've been working with um, Cascadia Partner Forum for um, about three years, I think now. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to engage um, on this journey and trying to improve um, Indigenous engagement within all of our thinking cross-border uh, throughout the region. So I'll go through quickly this. Um, me touched on some of this stuff, but this is kind of an overview of, of what's been done, how it's been incorporated, and where we're heading next in relation to Indigenous engagement. So we wanted to co-develop the strategy from the outset and include Indigenous knowledge because Indigenous people have a unique climate impact insights, unique mitigation strategies and resilience um, mechanisms, and unique needs. And we're also really wanting to be responsive both in Canada and the United States to um, sort of policy statements and directives from um, our commitments of national governments to increase equity and justice through things such as um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We also want to ensure that we have uh, a more equitable and just society generally um, amongst all of our, our relations and make, make the whole world, um, well, the whole world, the whole society, a much better um, place to be for all of us. So those are some of the motivations for this development. Um, there's, a, you know, Cascadia Partner Forum operates at you know, I've been engaged at uh, certainly three different levels. And so throughout the, the whole forum, there exists these statements which support Indigenous engagement, the respect for knowledge, cultural values and practices, and the understanding of the sovereign nation or the sovereign relationships that Indigenous peoples have, particularly tribes in the States with the federal government through treaty, but also in Canada in non-treaty environments. So it's important that, um, we recognize those types of things. I think, you know, I mentioned that First Nations and tribes hold really important information about climate change, about climate change mitigation, about climate change adaptation and resilience because they've been here forever and have seen through the thousands of millennia, all sorts of climate change from the 500 year drought in the Southwest um, that uh, in the middle of the last millennia, as well as the glaciation that occurred, you know, around 20,000 and more years ago. So we've known from the example, recent white sands finding, but also from indigenous history, that people have been here forever adapting and, and moving through changing environments. So we have a lot to learn from that. And so we recognize that within this strategy. Um, there's a lot of work to do to be more um, responsive to the specific types of information that would say inform particular adaptation strategies for people, but we're getting there. It's a slow process um, because of various constraints within indigenous communities in particular um, related to capacity, for example, and as well from some of the approaches that have typically characterized um, government and non-governmental agencies uh, approach to engagement with indigenous people. So I don't know why these are all different sides, but Mead mentioned these, but we want to really take a look at these um, principles for um, moving through 
the engagement strategy. So we talked about responsibility and really being responsible for the content and character of our relationships. We wanted to make sure that we're always coming to relationship with Indigenous people with this notion of reciprocity and how can we work together? How can I share when I'm asking to be shared with relevance? We wanted to make sure that in this work that it it always was trying to seek to be relevant to Indigenous nations, their priorities, visions, and goals. Um, in one of the actions you'll see later that um, that's related to the strategy is really delving deeper into some of the uh, adaptation plans that tribes have been doing on their own and really trying to be making sure that we're always remaining consistent and relevant to those priorities. Um, and this relationality, which is really this long-term development of mutually beneficial relationships, and Mead mentioned capacity across all uh, involved parties, but um, I draw your attention to the particular challenges that are faced by indigenous governments when it comes to financing and human resources um, and technological wherewithal to be able to engage in these conversations. Um, these were some principles we kind of worked on specifically around um, the moving through adaptation. And I think there's a theme here in that we really wanted to make sure that as we're drawing, as we're having these relationships, we begin to think about how to draw, um, how to come to a mutualistic agreement about what people are saying around climate change. I was just talking to an elder this morning. He's like, I know a lot about climate change. It comes out of that cultural information, processes of getting to know the earth through um, spiritual relationships, um, through the application of story-based principles, those kinds of things. So we wanted to um, be open to all of those insights. As I mentioned before, this evolution of, of the relationship and how we co-develop agreements is, is beginning, I think, in earnest as a result of uh, the various political and uh, ecological and um, moral factors that go into the decisions to want to have better relationships with Indigenous people. And um, one of the things as you're thinking through some of this, the strategy number two in particular, and when you're thinking about the work that we need to be doing to continuously uh, meet our commitments to centering Indigenous knowledge is that there's a lot of opportunity to engage um, Indigenous knowledge at these various levels, including um, at the working group level and the, and the leadership team and the uh, st uh, strategy uh, adaptation group. <laughs> so um, one of the notes I would make here is that um, climate change as we're seeing now is beginning to be thought across all these multiple fronts across multiple jurisdictions and meet outlined all of the different challenges and areas we need to focus. This is really in line with indigenous thinking sort of how to hold this comprehensive body of interacting knowledge um, within a space and be okay with that. I think it um, helps us to, to move beyond sort of the reductionist type of mindset. So that's really important. One of the things that's important to realize about Indigenous knowledge is that it also contains not only particular prescriptions around, for example, where to harvest a particular resource, but also that those directives are have a real um, legal bent. They're really, in essence, the law in a lot of the case for how things should happen. So they're more than just a preference, for example, but they are actually law. And I think that's one of the things as we're moving through, we really need to be thinking about how to make sure that we're conversing in the relevant levels with each other and what the relevance, uh, what the relevant authority is of various knowledge systems. And just this commitment to continue to build and learn and, and understand more deeply. Strategy two, uh, Mead mentioned, um, Oops, so she went over that, that's great. There's lots of work there, I think. Um, I think my slide might be out of order, but um, you know, large landscape resilience, the, the vision of large landscape um, connectivity is really resonates for First Nations really well, particularly in Cascadia through all the um, cross-border large nations, for example, the Colvin, the Okanagan being of the same culture. Um, it's really, it's, a, it's an important vision for those, for Indigenous people to grasp onto, especially when the um, US-Canada border is an imposition, a very recent imposition that divided those um, political cultures. So um, as uh, both Bill, and um, Mead mentioned indigenous participation on the working group. Um, you know, myself is on the strategy core team. We need more on the leadership team. So there's still this um, opportunity for indigenous peoples. If you know people who are interested in this work to come and engage at these various levels, it's certainly um, remaining open. And still we all are in recognition that as this process continues to, to advance, 
we could be needing to perhaps shift direction or be even more responsive to indigenous priorities or indigenous knowledge, which um, tells us so. Oh, these are the actions. They were a little out of, out of um, order, but Mead mentioned ethical space. Um, we wanna talk about the consistency with agreements and, and sovereignty-based principles of authority within both countries, this um, recognition of UNDRIP um, and how to continually make those references within agreements with each other and thinking about the priorities that are maybe articulated in tribal adaptation plans, but also may not be articulated out in a formal documentation process, but live within community. And um, this notion of indigenous protected areas, especially this cross-border notion, I think has a real um, an opportunity for a lot of traction given the new um, political regime in the United States, which happens to be um, complementary to the Canadian uh, Trudeau regime of making sure that we meet our collective international goals of, to conserve 30% uh, of the earth by 3030 and um, even more, um, some people want half and I think that's a great goal. And then again, to reiterate this notion of capacity. So those challenges around capacity are something that we recognize and we haven't quite um, solved yet, but we're committed to thinking through and doing the best we can within this um, strategy and implementation through the implementation process of this strategy. So I would just conclude with that. I know we don't have a lot of time, but if anyone wants to um, you know, connect with me and discuss these kinds of things um, further, particularly if you are First Nations or a tribal and you wanna engage, or if you have um, other colleagues who, who may be operating in that sphere as well, that would be great. Okay, and that is it. I talk quickly, but I know that there's more exciting work that we're gonna do collectively now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gwen. Um, yes, we are sort of cruising through. And as you can see, there's a lot, um, a lot of work and thought that has been going into this blueprint. Um, it does mean, however, that we're running a little bit late. So we're, we're sort of adjusting on the fly and things will, will go in slightly different order than originally planned. But for the rest of the time we have together, we want to hear from you and, and some of your initial thoughts on uh, what you heard about the blueprint and in particular those strategies. And one thing that I want to share to, to really provide some context to, um, to this input that we'll be asking from you is, you know, like in many planning processes, there, once you have uh, a product like the blueprint, there's that tension between how uh, sort of taking advantage and leveraging the current work and, and emerging initiatives that are ongoing right now versus continuing to, to do the more sort of systematic approach to, to planning and looking at what, what is that comprehensive implementation plan that will um, help us be most effective in that implementation. And so our approach is really how can we take advantage of the strengths of both both of these approaches. How can we, I, let's identify where those opportunities are to leverage current work through implementation of these strategies and really help support um, that work and scale it up to this large landscape transboundary scale. But let's also identify where are the gaps, where are there some of those strategies that we shared that there isn't the kind of um, comprehensive action that is needed. And let's take the time for those strategies to really um, more systematically plan out how to implement them to be most effective. So I'd like you to keep that in mind as we move through these, these quick exercises to get some input um, and your thoughts on this blueprint. So the first... Um, part that we want to hear from you on is, as you've heard already, the blueprint is organized around these six key strategies. And what we would like to hear from you is from your perspective and the work that you do, which of these six strategies do you consider have the most immediate potential for impact and, and really helping achieve those enabling conditions in the socio political landscape that me described. And so to hear your thoughts on this, um, I'm going to launch a quick poll that just shows 
the, the six strategies and what we would like you to do is to choose two of them. Which are the two that you consider uh, have the greatest potential for impact uh, in the, uh, in the of, of these whole six? So we'll give it just a, a minute or so for folks to uh, select the two that you think have the greatest potential. So we still have uh, about 10 people who need to add their, their thoughts. So I'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll show you where, um, where we landed. Okay, so last five seconds, four, three, two, one. Okay, so um, as you can see from the results here, there really seems to be potential across all six strategies for, for achieving impact with, I would highlight uh, strategy two uh, around centering Indigenous leadership, sovereignty and values, and strategy three focused on mainstreaming transboundary connectivity, conservation and climate adaptation into existing decision making structures to ensure implementation. So thank you for that. Um, we our our efforts in um, moving forward are focused on how to best support and um, and leverage and and sort of have an efficient transition into implementation. And so we will use this information to help us do that. So, sorry, here I'm having a bit of trouble with Zoom. I don't have a big enough screen to show all the bits and pieces that it wants me to show. Um, so because we are, we are tighter on time than we had hoped, we're going to sort of switch around and, and jump to um, what originally we planned as the last activity. Um, and this really is an effort to hear from you where do you see the alignment between the strategies that are in the blueprint and the work you do? So which are those strategies that really align with your values and your organization's missions and mandates? But also within that, we really would like to hear your perspectives on are there some of these strategies that you know, if we implemented these strat this strategy together, and um, that would really enable your work and the work that your organization is carrying out to really have that greater impact that we are pursuing. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat a, a link to a Google form um, where we essentially ask you that question, but in a way that is easy to just sort of pick and choose and click on um, on your answers. So let me get that in the chat here. Um, so we'll give everyone just um, about five minutes to um, to go into that questionnaire uh, that I've put the link in the chat. And to answer, there's just a couple of questions, um, plus making sure that we know who you are so we can follow up, um, as I said, as we transition towards um, supporting implementation and, um, and further implementation planning where needed. And feel free to unmute and let me know um, if you're having any trouble with the 
um, with the Google form. It looks like we've got about half the responses in. So we'll give it just a few more minutes and hopefully we can get um, everyone's responses in. Um, I will say as, as you continue to, uh, to work on that, that this is actually hugely important to us in terms of our ability to identify the people who really um, need to be involved as part of implementation, uh, because the success of this blueprint is really dependent on all of us working together to, to implement these strategies. So really appreciate you taking the time to um, to share your thoughts and, and bring that uh, to bear on your responses here. Okay, feel free to um, to continue working on that if you if you haven't completed your response and submitted it. Um, we we are right up at the um, almost at the top of the hour. Uh, I did want to share with you that we are interested in in getting specific input on um, these questions that um, 
on the, the opportunities and gaps. And so um, we hope that you will take some time to explore the action library that Mead showed and that you give some thought and, and hopefully send us your thoughts and your feedback on um, these questions related to those opportunities and gaps. So what are activities or initiatives, projects, programs? What is the work that you see that is ongoing or that is emerging and really gaining momentum where implementing these blueprint strategies can really leverage or scale up or in other ways support and, and enhance the impact that these current um, efforts uh, can have. Uh, so please, we'll, we'll send something out after the, the webinar with um, a place where you can uh, share some of your thoughts on that. And then the other side of the coin, thinking of those blueprint strategies where there really isn't that momentum. There isn't a, a direct effort focused on implementing these strategies. Let us know where those gaps are so that we can really uh, focus our efforts uh, in, in more comprehensive implementation planning on those gaps where the, the need is, is most important. So with that, I will skip through um, these details and just wrap up with uh, letting you know what our next steps are. So the team that, that has been working uh, and, and really leading this co-development effort our focus is shifting for 2022, um, mainly to initially to these first two bullets of, uh, as I said, that combination and hopefully a good balance between completing implementation planning where there are gaps and not enough attention currently with also supporting implementation and really supporting the, the implementation of those strategies that can leverage the current work that is ongoing. In addition, we are also looking at, um, at identifying spatial priorities uh, to, to inform and, and support decisions in under these different strategies where it makes sense. And also, as I mentioned early on, this effort was a pilot project. And part of the reason why it was a pilot was that it focused on these two groups of um, conservation targets, salmonids and large carnivores, which we felt were important and representative of some of the large uh, scale transboundary issues that needed to be addressed but is by no means a comprehensive list of strategies. So we, uh, sorry, of conservation targets. So as we move through uh, 2022, we will also be looking to set the stage for future phases and working out where that emphasis makes sense as we emphasize that, that this uh, blueprint for a resilient Cascadia is a living document, and we are looking forward to working with all of you to both implement it and adjust it and update it so that together we can be most effective at large landscape transboundary um, resilience within Cascadia. And with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating in this webinar. And we will let you know when our next quarterly check-in is, but likely sometime in April. Um, until then, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, and we will keep you informed.